Let us worship.
But this is a day that we celebrate what we have in common with all other Christian churches. Our uh, United Methodist Book of Worship tells us that this was first observed by Presbyterians in 1936, adopted by the Federal Council of Churches in 1940. You know your history. You know what was going on during those years. In the world, Christians decided instead of dividing ourselves, we would come together and celebrate what we have in common. So when we celebrate that today, I'm going to use a prayer out of our book of worship for this occasion. And then we'll have a time where we can lift up those in our midst and in our hearts who need prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we join with our siblings around the world in remembering Christ's sacrifice for us. For the opportunity to eat and drink together and for the life we have received, we give you thanks and praise. In the abundance of your many gifts, grant us grace to fill one another's lives with love. Remember, redeem, restore, and remold us until we are made new. Transform our daily bread into the bread of life and the cup that we drink into the cup of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. God, we also come this morning with hearts that are heavy for those who are suffering in our lives and in this world. And we lift them up now. Upcoming elections.
pray these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but the Lord has sinned. And thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now would you rise and cast the peace of Christ on earth.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the abundance of your presence in this room, for it fills and overflows our hearts and minds. Lord, for we know you, we experience you, we feel your presence, we behold your glory. And so, Almighty God, be with us right now, that our hearts will be open to your word, to a message of love and encouragement, perhaps that we have not heard before in this way. Lord, for every word you have already spoken, and yet our ears oftentimes do not listen clearly, and our minds do not fully understand, and our bodies do not fully feel the presence of your Spirit. And so, Lord, fill us with your Spirit now. Lord, for we seek to know you above all else. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Well, friends, today we celebrate World Communion Sunday. <coughs> World Communion Sunday, as Pastor Clayton mentioned, that began back in the 40s, where we take a moment to stop and to realize that one church is not big enough for a great God. Let me say that again. That one church, whether that means to you a local congregation, whether that means to you the church down the street or up the road or across the bridge, whether that means to you as many denominations as there might be. Now, let me get a little bit on the other side here, and, 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 and you won't tell me when to quit, so I'm just going to go. That means not only... Those whom we love and those whom we know, but perhaps other peoples, other denominations, dare I say, other faith traditions, that no one and nothing in this world is large enough or complete enough or exhaustive enough to contain the fullness of God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, if your God is only Methodist, you are serving a small God. <laughs> Friends, that is a tiny little nickel dime store size God. And by the way, that is not the God I know, and that is therefore not the God I preach. The God I know can do everything and anything, can move mountains, can transform hearts, can change the course of history and destiny, can make the cosmos appear out of nothing, and that God speaks and things happen. That's the God we serve, and that's the only God I know. And so every now and then, we need to be reminded, perhaps through World Communion Sunday, perhaps through other times and dates during the year and, and the church calendar, if you would, that we serve a great God. And yet, we serve a great God whose greatness and grandeur is reflected in the strength of humility. God larger and stronger than the cosmos, who is willing to enter into the human heart. The same God who created the stars out of dust is the same God who created you. And because we are people, and by the way, you've heard me say it before, but I'll say it again. People are people. If you don't want people to disappoint you, change your expectations. <laughs> Let me say it again. Turn to your neighbor. Tell the neighbor, you are people. <laughs> tell the neighbor, if 
You don't want to disappoint me. I need to change my expectations. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm, that's a hard lesson, folks. But because we are people, there is the issue of grace and the issue of the law and how we maneuver both of those sides of our understanding of God. Now, let me say that these are problems and matters and struggles that we face that God does not face. God does not have any issue with there being a world with too much righteousness or too much grace. We don't understand it. For God, this is not a problem. Because sometimes we feel that somehow righteousness and justice and love and grace are at odds or at competition with each other. But friends, for God, this is not a problem. All right? So turn to your neighbor and tell a neighbor, God does not have a problem. We have a problem. And so I read to you today from Galatians, from the third chapter. It says so in verse 19. So why was the law given? Well, friends, when a law is given, it's because somebody's doing something. How many of you have children at home? Yeah. How many of you behave like children at home? Hey. So... Usually, when somebody tells you not to do something, it's because you have already done it. Amen? Okay, if you don't say amen, then friend, you are lying to yourself. <laughs> or you're a much better person than I am. We have two children at home, one teenager and me. <laughs> So why was the law given? Well, it was given, it was added because of offenses. Until the descendant would come to whom the promise had been made. Now friends, the descendant is you. You are the descendant. You are the offspring. You are it. And let me show you why. Until the descendant would come to whom the promise had been made, it was put in place through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now the mediator does not take one side, but God is one. It's not Christ and the Spirit and God the Creator fighting it out in some kind of eternal cosmic battle, but it does mean that God speaks to us in a way that we understand because God is so kind and so loving and so gracious that God is willing to do that. So is the law against the promises of God? No! The promises of God are the fulfillment of the law. If the law had been given that was able to give life and righteousness would be in, would in fact have come from the law. But wait a minute, what does that mean? It means that we struggle. It means that when we do something, we don't like to be told not to do it. Louise. Quit hitting your brother. But he's mean. It doesn't mean you should hit him. If a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would in fact have come from the law. Friends, but scripture locked up all things under sin, so that the promise based on faithfulness, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ might be given to those who have faith. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Not our faithfulness to Christ, but the faithfulness of Christ. 
So, Pastor, you're telling me that even on the days that I am not faithful, Christ's faithfulness is enough for the world? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That God's faithfulness in Christ is sufficient to cover our own lack of faithfulness because the power vested in Christ by God, the formation of heaven and earth combined, the fullness of humanity and the fullness of divinity combined in Christ, that there is enough faithfulness to overflow that we may be covered under the faithfulness of Christ so that even when we are not faithful, we are still loved and forgiven. Pastor, what do I have to do? Nothing. What do you mean nothing? God loves you. That's the answer. Because when we have a child, even when the child turns away from us, we do not turn away from the child. based on the faith of Christ so that those of us who struggle with faith as you and I do from time to time are able to rely upon God's grace and receive the faith of Christ even when we do not understand it or even want it. Locked up until faith that was coming would be Revealed, so that the law became our guardian, so that the law gave us boundaries and a place to be, so that we would not hurt one another. Because again, if we did not hurt one another, there would be no need for the law. Until Christ fulfill the law so that we may be made righteous by his faith. How many of you know the language? And if you want to raise your hand, you are welcome to do so. And perhaps you've heard this in a church that you belong to at one point. How many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? How many of you know that language, right? Okay, friends, that's great. But what's most important is that Christ accepted you. Because the last time I checked, Christ was already acceptable whether you understood that or not. And so therefore we are saved by the grace of God and by the faith of Christ and not by our faith in Christ. And if you don't believe me, I invite you to read Galatians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. And if you read it in the Greek, it reads even better. Because in English we add some weird prepositions that get us into trouble, and in Greek that preposition is removed, and so we are forced to then read what the text says instead of what we believe it has said for the last 500 years. So that, by the faith of Christ, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian, for now we have one another to care for each other in love. So that when we hurt one another, we are able to rely upon God's grace to say simply these words, I did it, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That's the threefold apology that Isabella learned when she was three years old. I did it, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. So that our motivation does not come from keeping the law, but because the law has kept us. So that our motivation comes not as re 
receiving grace one day when I die, but because God's grace already lives in me, and the faith of Jesus Christ empowers me not only to be sorry for what I've done, not only to claim that which I have done, but also to move forward and do better next time. And yet, we hurt each other in such a way that every now and then, we need a Sunday like today to remind us that we are all children of God, that we are all related to one another, that we are all beloved by God, and that whether we like each other or not, that does not make any difference. Turn to your neighbor and tell the neighbor, if you don't like anybody, go ahead. God don't care. Because God loves us because of who we are, in spite of what we do, and because there is enough righteousness and faithfulness and commitment and love and grace in Christ that even when we lack these things, God provides for us. So that grace comes before the law and not as a carrot that I'm always chasing after. So that, beloved, I can rejoice in the law of Moses, for Christ has given me the glory to execute it. I am righteous, and we are righteous, not because we have to, but because we love to. Tell, tell your neighbor, neighbor, I love behaving good. <laughs> tell your neighbor, I love being loving. Tell your neighbor, I love being gracious. Because the grace of God is sufficient to overcome everything else. Chapter 20 and chapter 3 in verse 25 it says, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. For you are all God's children through the faith of Christ. He claimed you even when you did not claim him. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so therefore, beloved, now listen to these words. You know, and some theologians say that this is somewhat of a poem, a hymn that was perhaps used at the time of baptism and sacrament in the early church. Some say it's an inspiration to the church that speaks to us through the millennia. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. And I'm going to add my own understanding or anything in between. But friends, I'm neither Jew nor Greek. My parents came from Venezuela, so I'm included in there somewhere. And then it says, there is neither slave nor free or anything in between. And there is neither male or female or anything in between for all of you. And, and by the way, this is really interesting because if I were to translate this into English from the original text, the you is plural. So really what the Bible says, for all of you all. That's what it says, all of you, all of you, all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, remember how I said the descendant was you? If you belong to Christ, then indeed, truly, sure. The saying is worthy to be said. You are now a 
descendant of Abraham and an heir of the promise. Every single one of you in this room, and I want to look at you in the eye. I'm taking my time. All right? I'm taking my time. Hey, you, you entertain yourselves. Don't give me a moment. <laughs> this is a pastoral privilege. I want to look at you. I want to look at you. There you are. And, and you all watching at home or wherever you are, I want to look at you in the eye too. And I see you all right there. Every single one of you, because of the faith of Christ, is a descendant of Abraham and therefore an heir of the promise and therefore a child of God. Turn to your neighbor and tell the neighbor, you are a child of God. Whether you like it or not. Praise be to God and let the church say, Amen. 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 Friends, as we prepare to receive Holy Communion today, I want to remind you that because the promise comes from God, and even though the promise came from Abraham, Abraham never fully understood what the promise would look like and my guess is that Abraham looks into our eyes today and looks into the eyes of God today. And Abraham says, Lord, I did not know this is what you meant. You mean all of these people? And God says to him, yeah, all of these people. All of these people. And then some are welcome. To the Lord's table. Whether you are a United Methodist, whether you are a Christian, whether you come from another faith tradition that I do not even fully know or understand. As Pastor Clayton says from time to time, whether you know Christ, whether you love Christ, whether you want to love Christ or whether you want to want to love Christ, you are invited to this table. Because this is where somehow, by a mystery of faith, heaven and earth touch. And by faith, not my faith, Christ's faith. We are able to see and handle things unknown. I'm going to invite one of our lay ministers, Sonia Wither, to please come forward and join me here at the table. Friends, Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin, all who seek to live in peace with one another, all who want to know him, all who want to be in relationship with each other and want to experience Christ, all who don't know him yet. Christ invites all through his own faith. And so therefore, beloved, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, I invite all of us to 
take a moment in silence. Say unto Almighty God, our loving God, Lord, I've done some things. I'm sorry that I've done some things, and I don't plan to do them again. Beloved children of God, I say unto you, hear the good news that Christ died for us, although we were yet sinners, that proves God's love towards us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, you have made from one human race every nation and people to live on the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. One night, he gave himself up for us. He took the bread and gave thanks to you. Broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here out of love for you and one another that we may know you and experience you in a new way. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his love. Lord, renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, 
All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, at this time, I'd like to invite all of the pastors and those who are assisting, please come forward that we may prepare for the feast. I want to remind you that if you would like to receive gluten-free communion, please let one of the servers know as we want to make sure that it is available to you and that all are invited. Won't you come?
yourself to us in this holy mystery, the bread and wine. Lord, we thank you for you have united us with peoples from all over this world, those whom we know, those whom we do not know, and yet you have claimed us. And so, Lord, on this day, we are reminded of your love, of your compassion, and your grace for all people. Lord, we have little to do but to say thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Let all God's people say, Friends, I ask you to be seated for just a few moments. We have a couple of announcements of things that are happening in the life of the church. Friends, would you give Dale Vanderpool a nice big round of applause? And Dale, come tell us a little bit about the mercy of Just to remind everybody, we do have these bags uh, most weeks. They'll be right there in the back corner of the church. Anybody can take them. Uh, they're there to hand out to anybody that uh, you find on the street corner or in the parking lots. We do have plenty of them, so please feel free to take as many as you want. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> Friends, we also have an announcement from Sonia and Katie Wheeler about the Christmas parade. Come right up. Give her a nice round of applause. so thankful for our church and we had an amazing service. If you could not feel the spirit, you are dead. <laughs> so, Katie does the work and I do the talking. It's kind of like Moses and Aaron. <laughs> which is okay. We have another season of Thanksgiving coming up very quickly. Christmas. If you have children, you know how fast that gets here. So, what the church would like to do is be a part of the Baytown Christmas Parade and the Mont Bellevue Christmas Parade. December 5th for Baytown, that's on a Thursday night. December 8th for Mont Bellevue, which is a Sunday night. But we need a truck and a trailer. Maybe you don't have it. Maybe you do. If you know someone, if you're passionate about it and you want to see the smiles on these children's faces, and be a part of the parade, please let us in. Because we want to not just share the joy, we want people to see our church and let them know that you are welcome. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, you are welcome here and you are loved. So if you would like to be a part of that and would like to help out, maybe you don't want to drive, but you may say, well, pastor could drive it. <laughs> Pick him up. Let's be excited about it and spread the word of our church and the gospel every way we can. Amen. Thank you. Friends, at the end of this month, on Halloween night, the 31st of October, I know that there are going to be children looking for candy everywhere in the community. Amen. And so, what we have decided to do in order to create a greater impact in the neighborhoods in which we live is to select several neighborhoods that we may be methodical and be where the children are, right? Because, friends, we cannot expect for people to come to us. We need to go where the people are, amen? That's the ministry of Christ. You don't wait for them. You go to them. And so, you'll see the sign-up come up here in the next few weeks, but for now, this is what I'm asking all of us to do. When you go to the store this week, friends, I know all of you go to the store at least once a week because I see you there. I run into you, right? See, my brother James and I, we go around the same time every time. So I'm always on the way in or he's on the way out of it. Yes. And so what I'm asking you to do is to put a bag of candy in your basket and bring it to church next week so that we are able to pass out candy to a number of neighborhoods and be hospitable and be loving and reach out to those children and those families. So turn to the person next to you and tell them, don't forget to bring candy next Sunday.
Friends, the last thing that I want to share with you today is that on October 12, on Saturday, the Texas Annual Conference will be hosting a revival at Spring at Faith United Methodist Church in Spring, right up the road on 45. And our choir is going to be there to lead music on Saturday at 1.30. And so if you would like to attend, and I encourage all of us to be there, then please let one of us know, either Heather or myself or Pastor Clayton or Pastor Ellen, and we want to make that invitation and that information available to you. Again, the choir will be leading that revival on Saturday, October the 12th. Beloved, would you please stand for our closing blessing? Turn to your neighbor and tell a neighbor. Neighbor. Go ahead, tell a neighbor. Neighbor. God chose you. God chose you. Tell a neighbor. Neighbor. God is choosing you today. God is choosing you today. Friends, Jesus said, love each other. I have loved you. And so therefore, beloved, love boldly, love deeply, love united. All of these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may go in peace.